Thank you for joining us today for the Digital Conversations and Coffee to discuss the Southern Lake Huron Management Unit. My name is Megan Goss, and I work for Michigan State University Extension and Michigan Sea Grant as an extension educator in the Saginaw Bay region. And I'm joined here today by uh, different partners from Michigan Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division. So here sitting next to me. Hi, I'm Elise Walter. I'm the Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division Communications Specialist based out of Lansing. I'm Randy Claremont, Michigan Department of Natural Resources, and I'm the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator. I'm actually located up at the Odin State Fish Hatchery. And I'm Jim Baker. I'm the Southern Lake Huron uh, Fisheries Unit Manager. Uh, I cover this part of Michigan for fisheries programs, uh, about 22 counties worth here. And I'm Katherine Schroeder, a fisheries biologist here in the management unit. I cover the northern part of our Southern Lake Huron management unit. For this next portion, um, we will now be outlining the purpose of these conversation and coffee meetings uh, before we have our different partners, uh, uh, Jim, Randy, and Catherine, answering uh, questions related to uh, the fishing regulation changes for this upcoming year. Megan. So we as the DNR's Fisheries Division have been hosting conversations and coffee for the last few years. These are intended to serve as an informal opportunity to engage conversations with us where you get to ask the questions or you get to choose the topics that you'd like to discuss about local and statewide fishing, whether it's recreational based, regulatory, um, management based, whatever topic tickles your fancy we want to hear about. This is just one of many meetings that is held throughout the state, but what's unique about this opportunity is that it's the only digital option. So thank you to the Southern Lake Michigan staff for being willing to serve in this role as a type of guinea pig. Um, but we do still have additional meetings going on this week, next week, and even into May throughout other portions of the state. So if you have an interest in a different region where we are working on fisheries issues, be sure to check out michigan.gov slash fishing to see when those other meetings are coming up. So next, um, we will discuss changes to the fishing regulations and Yeah, uh, thanks Megan. Thanks Elise. <clears throat> so to cover the Southern Lake Huron Management Unit updates and um, proposed and current regulation changes, you know, a good way to segue into this is we often get the question, um, you know, what are the regulation changes for this upcoming fishing season? How will I know what those changes are? I heard rumors that um, such regulation might be changing. So the whole idea behind the meetings is uh, these conversations of coffee is to explicitly go through those changes. Um, if you click on the next slide, Megan, for me, what you, what, uh, you should be able to see in our fishing guide, um, it's very explicit in terms of the new regulation changes for the upcoming fishing season, which just started April 1st. And those major changes are outlined in red font throughout the entire guide. So for example, on page two, if I turn to my fishing guide, um, you can see it, it says new regulations appear in red text and appear throughout the guide. And that way it's a, it's a simple way to look through to see what changed from last year's fishing season to this year. So we wanna talk about um, the regulation changes that are in red, what they mean and field any questions that you might have regarding those changes. Um, if you go ahead and click on the next slide, which what you'll be able to see is um, on page 14, have that right, is, um, I'm sorry, page 12 of the fishing guide is a table of all of our major or general fishing regulations from uh, large and smallmouth bass to walleye, northern pike, musky, yellow perch, and if you see, um, None of those regulations have changed except for yellow perch. And yellow perch, in the middle of the table, there's a red 25. And that red 25 explains or shows that there's a statewide regulation change to the yellow perch daily possession limit for this 2019 fishing season. Of which I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and Jim's going to talk about uh, the details in the background. Behind that, go ahead and click on the next slide. That's right, Randy. Uh, the statewide yellow perch daily bag limit went to 25 per day on April the 1st. Now, as some of you may remember, we've been talking about trying to standardize the perch bag limit for the last couple of years. 
We did an extensive campaign last year to gather public comment concerning our proposal to do this. We had meetings with our warm water resources steering committee with all four of the Great Lakes advisory committees. We talked about it at the Sea Grant Fishery Workshops, and it was discussed in articles in Michigan Outdoor News, uh, Woods and Water News, the Great Lakes Sport Fishing News, and in other outdoor publications. We also did an online survey that was taken by 18,743 people. The consensus of the various committees was that a 25 perch daily bag limit was a fair number for one angler to take home after a day's fishing. And in the online survey, 63.8% of the respondents preferred reducing the bag limit to 25 or less per day. Now that doesn't mean everyone agreed with it everywhere, but a substantial majority of anglers think 25 perch per day is enough for one angler. Yellow perch populations around the state are either stable or contracting in most of our larger fisheries, and they are probably were overexploited in some inland lakes under the 50 fish bag limit. Also, there were so many local variations and exceptions, such as 25 fish here, but 50 there, and 35 over there, uh, that the new rule will hopefully be much easier to understand and enforce. Uh, two exceptions still remain. In Lake Erie, the perch bag limit stays at 50. This is because Lake Erie is managed jointly by four states and Ontario, and each jurisdiction gets an annual quota of the total allowable catch, which is also called the TAC. In Michigan's part of Lake Erie, the best of the perch fishing lasts for about six to eight weeks every year, and even at 50 per day, we never get close to our portion of the total allowable catch. The other exception is for Lake Gogebic up in the UP, where the bag limit is 25 per day, but no more than five perch over 12 inches. So those are the, the only two remaining exceptions. And uh, we hope that uh, we will have less problems dealing with Great Lakes versus inland issues where we had a 25 perch bag in Saginaw Bay, but 50 perch per day in the cuts and in the rivers and so forth. So it should work well for our area here, and it should be easier to understand and enforce uh, statewide also. Thanks, Jim. And as Jim alluded to, uh, you know, we, there's a, a social survey was done, and before we go to the next slide, um, I want to kind of point to the last bullet, and that is there's still concern from some anglers that the 25 bag limit or daily possession limit is not restrictive enough. And so there's some discussion about whether or not in, uh, not this year, but in upcoming years, we should include a five fish over 12 inches, similar to what was, um, what is in place for Lake Gogibic and the UP. So uh, one of the things I just want to point out is if you have comments on uh, the regulations that we're talking about for the 2019 season, or we get to these proposed regulations, there's a chat box that Megan mentioned, you can go ahead and um, put insert your comments into that chat box and we'll be able to uh, look at those and respond to them. But that is one thing that, again, we'll look to is whether or not we need a more restrictive regulation. But I, uh, I, Jim characterized it well, the 25 fish is um, meant to get around a lot of the issues, uh, it, both socially and biologically in terms of perch management. If you look at the next slide then, um, you know, the social survey was sent out to um, all licensed anglers that provided us an email address in the last couple of years. And this was over 400,000 anglers received this uh, survey through their email. Um, the survey was extensive. We have a lot of um, information, but it really gave us an idea of, you know, kind of perch is one of the most diverse fisheries in the state of Michigan, both in terms of angler demographics from young anglers all the way up to, uh, uh, you know, very seasoned anglers, and also um, a, a range of conditions from fishing small ponds for yellow perch all the way up to Great Lakes Charter uh, 
uh, fishers targeting perch um, in, in the Great Lakes. So this is um, very diverse. So we wanted the survey to be able to uh, include that diverse fishery and, and angler demographics. We're not going to present a lot of the background behind that because it's been shared, but I do want to, if you click uh, again, we have this all summarized in a technical report that will be available, um, a very comprehensive report on the full history of yellow perch management in Michigan, some very um, uh, extensive synthesis of how we've managed perch populations, what this regulation is, is meant to do, and uh, you know we're excited to bring perch back and recruit new anglers through our great opportunities here in Michigan. Um, I'll just show one tidbit of that from that technical report. Uh, then this graph here, if you click again, shows you, I'm sorry, click backwards um, one, just once. Sorry, we're having a little technical difficulties here at the PowerPoint. But this right here is the distribution of anglers that preferred um, to stay at 50 fish per day, which was the regulation um, that was in place since 1979. What we were looking at was to see, as we were getting exceptions, were there hot spots in the distribution of anglers that wanted to keep a higher limit? And really, we didn't see that distribution. When you click on the anglers that preferred 25 or less, that's an X map, what you'll see is a much wider distribution um, and, and well representative of all of the anglers across the state. And we, we even had um, responses from several other US states as far as Alaska. So a lot of non-resident fishers as well. So we, we felt as though this data was the most represented and the anglers themselves were, were in favor of a more uh, restrictive 25 fish limit. So again, uh, if you click again, this is just an idea of how we can um, gauge these regulations, what is behind that number in, on page 12 in the guide, and why the regulation changed. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Jim, and Jim will cover um, a, the next series of regulation changes that are going to appear in the guide. And again, you can um, click on questions that you might have. So Jim, what other, besides perch, what else is changing? Well, the next uh, big change, I guess, would be the lake trout bag limit up in MH1. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the area around Detour, Cedarville, uh, St. Ignace, Mackinac City, Sheboygan, and down to just south of Rogers City on Lake Huron. Uh, MH1 is a lake trout management unit. Now the daily, bag limit for lake trout in that area uh, has been three fish for many years, three fish per day. This year it's being reduced to two fish per day, two lake trout per day. Uh, it's part of the 1836 treaty waters and under the 2000 consent degree uh, the fishery is divided between the state and the tribes with each entity assigned a quota of the lake trout. The Michigan Recreational Fishery has been exceeding its annual quota for a few years now. And in order to get in compliance with the consent decree, we have to reduce our catch in the coming years to make up for the overharvest in the previous years. Hence the reduction from three lake trout per day to two per day. Uh, however, in the rest of Lake Huron, which is outside of the treaty waters, uh, the uh, daily bag for lake trout stays at three fish per day. And Jim, I just want to add, for uh, those of you on the webinar, page 20 and 21 of the guide, there's an extensive map and color-coded table that, again, it will explicitly show all the changes and uh, the regulations for trout and splake across the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. Moving on, uh, we have a change in uh, registration for fishing tournaments. Uh, the principal change here is that in 2019, in addition to bass tournaments, uh, which have been required to register with the state uh, for a couple of years now, uh, walleye and muskie tournaments are now also required to register with the Michigan Fishing Tournament Information System. There are instructions on page 62 of the fishing guide for how to register and also for what kinds of contests need to register. Uh, the definition of a fishing tournament is fairly discreet and it does not include such things as 
local fishing contests where there's a prize for the biggest fish caught or the most fish caught or something like that. So uh, please uh, take a look at those uh, criteria on page 62. Uh, the registration is free and it's all done online. <clears throat> Moving along, um, drop shotting, which is a uh, fairly popular method of fishing for bass, is now legal in Drowned River Mouth Lakes. Uh, there is a list of Drowned River Mouth Lakes on page 18 in the fishing guide. They're all on the west side of the state, and uh, they're also listed in the trout regulations as places with type F regulations. There's only one caveat with regard to uh, drop shotting in, in these lakes, and that is that you're limited to single pointed hooks measuring a half inch or less between the point and the shank. That's about a number four hook in most hook styles. Uh, Jim, a, can I add a little By all means. Just a caveat on that. Um, that regulation that was in place was really meant to prevent snagging of uh, salmon yes. returning to rivers. Um, and also it's in, kind of indicative of how um, strong the bass populations now are in the Great Lakes and in these drowned river mouth lakes. Um, the opportunities for bass fishing are incredible. Drop shotting is a great technique. So it was really meant to uh, kind of um, re respond to the changes in the system and allow for some more opportunity. Right. Okay, another change this year. Uh, is that until this year it was legal to use any number of hooks to fish for smelt in recognized smelt waters, but this rule has been rescinded. Now you can use any combination of three lines and six hooks, the same as for all other species. Um, basically what you can do here is you can use anything up to a combination of three lines and six hooks. In other words, you could have one line with six hooks on it if you wanted for smelt. That would be similar to what people have done in the past. You could use two lines with three hooks apiece, or you could use three lines with two hooks apiece, or any combination that adds up to three lines and six hooks. So uh, this is somewhat more restrictive uh, than in the past, but it probably has to do with the fact that uh, some anglers were using lots and lots of hooks on some of these waters to fish for other species and saying they were fishing for smelt when in fact they weren't. This was a change that our law division asked for. Uh, finally, in regard to changes this year, um, there are rule changes regarding scented artificial baits. A good example of these would be Berkeley's power baits. They're a plastic bait that has had some sort of a scent infused into them. Um, now you can use these scented baits everywhere except on flies only gear restricted trout streams. If the streams are, allow artificial lures only, you can use scented baits there. So that is a change from in the past. And that pretty much concludes the uh, major regulation changes we have for this year. There aren't a lot of them, so. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. And uh, I guess we can move on, Megan. Um, and again, if you, just to summarize on page two of the fishing guide, there will actually be a summary of all of the major changes um, on that page. So that's a, that's a good way if you want to go back after this webinar and look. The second page of the fishing guide will show you all of the major changes summarized that you'll see throughout the guide. So um, let's talk a little bit about the proposed changes for 2020. And I think um, this is next year's fishing guide. You know, as Jim mentioned, as a good example of the perch, when we go to uh, talk about proposed changes, we will have a lot of meetings with our stakeholders and with anglers to get, gather their um, responses to these before they're, they're made. So this is kind of our first maybe snapshot into uh, what you all might think about some of the proposed changes and see if you even have an opinion. So Jim's going to cover one, but let's ask you a question first. The question we're going to ask you is, um, as an angler in Michigan, do you fish for trout in inland lakes? Now, the nice thing about this webinar is you can go ahead and respond to this poll right now. We'll be able to kind of gauge those responses. 
Um, and then based on that, if, uh, if we have a lot of anglers that fish for trout in the lakes, we can talk in depth about some of the proposed changes for 2020 or we can just highlight them. So we got some responses coming in now. Um, so far, it doesn't look like we have any people that enjoy fishing for trout and inland lakes. Yep, and I would say for Southern Lake Huron Management Unit, that's not unexpected. They're, the opportunities are, are rather limited, but Jim, do you want to go ahead and cover the highlights then of this yeah. is a statewide regulation change? Yes, you would be right, Randy. We don't have a lot of trout lakes in this unit, and if the people that are tuning into this uh, webinar uh, fish in this unit, we just don't have a lot of that opportunity. They would have to go farther north. Anyway, here's what's proposed for next year. That would be that the open fishing season on inland trout lakes of pipes A and D, which is currently the uh, last Saturday in April through September 30th, would be lengthened and extend the season to allow fishing and possession through October 31st. Now the purpose of this proposal is to increase fishing opportunity for trout during the autumn uh, after many of our trout waters are closed. Uh, and both the type A and D lakes are basically stocked lakes. So protecting fish during the spawning season in these lakes is not really a concern. These are not places that trout are reproducing and these, are, these fisheries are maintained by stocking. So that is one proposal we have for next year. Excellent. And you know, feel free to uh, chime in however you feel about that. Another proposal that we're, um, we're looking to um, evaluate as a statewide regulation change is Cisco whitefish, round whitefish. Um, those have been part of a, a statewide regulation that um, is 12 in any combination for Cisco and Lake Whitefish, um, only 10 in, as a daily possession limit in boundary waters. However, round whitefish, um, also called Menominee, are not covered in the regulation. Therefore, they're covered in the section for other species with no size or daily possession limit. Um, part of the impetus behind looking at this regulation change is that both anglers and law enforcement division have expressed concern about being able to identify species. Um, uh, oftentimes we look at some of the uh, Saginaw Bay fishing um, Facebook groups. Um, there's a number of them out there that on both Facebook, social media, and every once in a while we'll see a, a round whitefish, I think just showed up last week um, with the angler posting it saying, does anyone know what this species is? Or uh, Cisco showing up and uh, somebody posting it saying, do you know what the species is? So because the regulation is different for each of the species, um, having a regulation change that combines them all into one is one of the things that we're looking for. Um, if you click on the next slide, you know, Megan, what you'll uh, show, be showing us here is, you know, this is a picture that I often use. Um, these three different species were caught in the exact same location. Um, rather similar in size, and yet the top one is a lake whitefish, the middle one is a cisco, and the one in the bottom is a round whitefish or Menominee. So to the average angler, these are very similar characteristics, and again, um, we want to have a regulation that's enforceable, um, that also applies to all the different species. So we're looking into that proposed change. Um, what is the change that's on the table that we will be seeking feedback on? Um, it's establishing a statewide regulation, the next slide will show that, of 10 fish in any combination for all three species. Um, and this would apply statewide with two exceptions. The first exception being for inland waters, and that would be five in any combination. And the sex, second exception would be Lake Superior, which would remain at 12 in any combination with, with an additional eight fish allowed between the period of September 1st through October 31st. So what's the basis behind these, um, these exceptions that are proposed? Uh, first is the recognition that the inland um, whitefish and cisco populations are just not as robust. Uh, some of the inland cisco populations are very unique um, and deserve some pro uh, additional protection. 
Likewise, we have pretty strong fisheries at times on, um, uh, let's say, Lake Whitefish and Higgins Lake, and you know, looking at some regulations to make sure that those fisheries remain sustainable. So the, those are the proposed exceptions. We'll be taking you know, comments and, and feedback on uh, whether or not that regulation should move forward in 2020. The next regulation proposed change that, uh, that we can discuss, and I wouldn't even really characterize this as a proposed change. Um, I kind of want to talk through, um, you go ahead and click on the next slide, Megan, what, what you'll be able to show is uh, you know, an example where we're paying attention to some of the walleye um, uh, discussions. Uh, this is from Saginaw Bay uh, Michigan Fishing Post on Facebook, and one of the anglers posted, um, you know, is it time to go back to the daily possession limit of five and the size limit of 15 for walleye in Saginaw Bay? So, um, you know, looking at those, you know, we've been, we analyze the data each year and look through, um, you know, how our regulations are, are matching, what the population indicators are, are showing us. And Saginaw Bay has a, a destination fishery for walleye. Um, it's one of the most um, robust and exciting fisheries in the state. Um, however, e even though we look at the biological data, it's very critical that there is social acceptance and support for our regulations in general. Um, so seeing posts like this suggests that, well, maybe we should have some more formal inquiries into the social acceptance behind the liberalized regulation of uh, an eight fish daily limit and a 13 inch minim minimum size limit that has been in place for walleye for the last few years for Saginaw Bay. So if you would, um, those of you online, just go ahead, we'll, you'll see a poll. And this is just an example of the question that we would ask. So you can read through each of these um, and, and you know, vote on your view of whether or not you think that the, the, the regulation in place is acceptable, whether or not you would like to uh, see either a reduction in the daily possession limit of eight um, or maybe an increase. Uh, likewise, um, you know, there's an option here whether or not you would prefer to even um, go back to the statewide regulation of five and 15. Um, so this is just an example of a poll and, and, and we'll be kind of looking at social acceptance of, uh, of, the, of the current regulation and, and getting input from anglers throughout the course of the year. There is no specific proposal. I would say this is just an example of us paying attention to some of the posts on social media some of the feedback we do receive. These are not binding decision-making inquiries. We're just kind of getting a temperature check. And um, you know, I look back at the yellow perch regulation change, the reduction to 25 is a good example where you know, we did multiple uh, venues of asking stakeholders and anglers their opinions, um, including the electronic email survey to over 400,000 anglers. So, you know, we do our homework and try to make sure that when we make a regulation change, it's the best option for the fishery and for the populations of fish. Um, so with that, I'd like to, um, you know, again, thank you for your, your comments um, and kind of turn it back over to Jim to talk about some of the exciting uh, stuff happening in the unit here in Southern Lake Huron and all the work that you guys do every year of extremely high quality, fantastic work. And um, Jim, can you tell us a little bit more? Well, uh, in terms of things that are happening in our unit this coming year, uh, one of the more interesting, I think, is that we will be planting coho salmon in Port Sanilac this spring. This is something pretty new. Cohos haven't been planted in Lake Huron since 1989. Uh, we're gonna try cohos again because their diet seems to match better with the current food web in Lake Huron. Uh, than what works for Chinook salmon. Uh, the Chinook salmon live almost exclusively on alewives, and we don't have alewives out there anymore to speak of. So uh, we decided to try the coho because the coho don't depend on alewives. They eat a variety of things. They will eat minnows, they will eat uh, smelt, they will eat 
terrestrial insects, so their diet is more like that of an Atlantic salmon. And we have plenty of terrestrial insects, we have a lot of minnows, so we think the cohos have got a fighting chance at making it out there. We have had a coho fishery at a low to moderate level in southern Lake Huron for a number of years. We're going to see if we can augment that a little bit. So there will be a total of 100,000 cohos planted into Lake Huron this year. Uh, roughly half of them will go to Port Sanilac, the other half to Thunder Bay River at Alpena. Um, in 2020, the plant sites will rotate to Harbor Beach and the Osable River. And then in 2021, back to Port Sanilac and Alpena again. Now, typically, cohos will show up in the fishery the year after they have been planted. So if we plant in 2019, they should start showing up in the early spring fishery along the outside of the thumb starting next year in 2020. And there should be a return fishery in the fall of 2020. Uh, we will see whether or not this works. It is an experiment. It is not guaranteed to work, and only time will tell. So I guess we'll see how it goes. Something else that I believe is of great significance uh, occurred in our area last fall, and uh, that is that uh, working in partnership with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Department of Natural Resources planted 1,900 fingerling lake sturgeon into the four tributary streams of the Saginaw River. That is the Titabawassee, the Shiawassee, the Cass, and the Flint. Uh, each river got 475 fish, plus or minus a couple. Roughly a third of the fish came from the Black River Rearing Station near Onaway from fry that were collected from Black Lake sturgeon. Uh, the other two-thirds were reared by the feds at the Genoa National Fish Hatchery in Wisconsin, and those fish were raised from eggs taken in the St. Clair River between Port Huron and Pearl Beach. Research on these fish up at Black Lake has shown that survival of these fingerlings is very good, but I guess we're going to have to see how they do in a system like the Saginaw with a so many large catfish in there. We expect they'll start returning to the rivers where they were planted around the year 2038. They take about 20 years to come back. So those of us who are still around in 2038 can go down to the river and see if the sturgeon came back. I'll be 83 then, but if I'm <laughs> still here, I'll be down there looking for them. Uh, we hope to continue this stocking program every year at some level for the next 20 years. Now, I'm particularly happy about this program finally getting started. Back in 1979 and 1980, I wrote my master's thesis on the ecology and management of Lake Sturgeon in Michigan, and I also had a hand in writing the Fish Division's Sturgeon Management Plan, where we identified the Saginaw River system as a high priority for rebuilding a population. Finally, after 40 years, it's all coming together. Uh, in other news from the area, back on October 30th, uh, we shocked Lexington Harbor to look at the extent of the Atlantic salmon return there. Uh, we did very well. We boated 92 Atlantics in about one half hour of shocking. We marked all the fish we handled with a tiny tail clip, and we never got a single recapture in three shocking runs. There were definitely two and possibly three year classes present, and the fish ran from 20 to 30 inches in length. We also boated 13 nice rainbow trout, probably of the domestic strain that we plant there that returns in the late fall. Uh, we could have kept working new fish all day long, but we figured that we had uh, had seen enough over there, and so uh, you know we we let the rest of them be for the day, and hopefully the, those fish got back to uh, spawning and biting fairly quickly. Uh, those are really the the biggest highlights of work from our unit this last year, um, but we do other things also. For instance. Uh, our crew surveyed 17 inland lakes and 17 stream segments. 
We helped research section with work on Saginaw Bay. We helped other units with their survey work. We helped hatcheries with statewide fish planting. We helped with the musky egg take on the Detroit River. We helped with the steelhead egg take at the Little Manistee Weir. And we tried really hard to uh, keep up with all of this stuff. And uh, more or less, we, we succeeded in getting our entire work plan accomplished. So, you know, we're pleased about that. Um, one last thing I would like to mention, the Sea Grant Fishery Workshops coming up in April. Uh, if you're interested in what's going on in Lake Huron and Saginaw Bay, you really should attend one of these meetings because they're entirely devoted to the Great Lakes issues. Uh, the closest meetings are one in Port Huron at the, uh, I think it was at the Legion Hall, but I may be wrong, on April 11th. And there's one at the Bay City Fairgrounds in the Canteen Hall on April 16th. Uh, all those meetings start at 6 p.m. and run until 9. Um, and uh, I hope that anyone that is really interested specifically in Saginaw Bay or Lake Huron would uh, join us at one of these meetings. Uh, you will learn a lot, I think, and you'll have a chance to uh, uh, ask questions and, and give input also. So that pretty much sums up our, uh, our work for 2018. Uh, we have a similar uh, work schedule coming up for 2019. And uh, that's pretty much it, Randy. Yeah, this is great, Jim. If I could just kind of highlight uh, <clears throat> some things that also the unit contributes a lot of workforce um, to other agencies and other endeavors. And you mentioned the sturgeon. You know, that's a great example of, of decades long of work that's finally coming uh, to be in terms of reintroduction of sturgeon in the four tributaries of the Saginaw River system. You know, likewise, they look at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service stocking of 1.2 million Cisco in outer Saginaw Bay last fall. It's mm -hmm. another example of work that the units contribute, contributed to and uh, that stocking should continue for five to 10 years, uh, but we'll be looking for those Cisco to show up and I believe some have already started to show up in some of the minnow um, uh, catches that uh, are conducted. The other thing, and maybe Catherine, you could speak to this is, um, you know, last week the unit completed tagging of uh, approximately 3,000 walleye uh, spawning in the Tittabwasi River in a matter of days. So, uh, you know, Catherine, can you talk about the, what anglers are supposed to do if they see a funny looking metal tag on the mouth of a walleye? Yeah, this year we put 3,000 jaw tags on the walleye, which 10% had reward tags of $100 on them. And they will say that right on the tag. And anglers who catch one are asked to report it either via our website um, or they can also uh, call them into our unit and there is a post office box also listed. And as soon as I get them, I will uh, get a letter back to you telling you, you know, about your fish, when it was tagged. Um, and if it was a reward tag, we verify that it was actually the reward tag. We need to see the tag and get a picture of it or you can bring it in and then we'll uh, send it to Lansing for processing and it, they'll send back a, the <clears throat> check to me and then I will set, mail you that with your information about your fish. And basically um, there are a lot of fish out there. We've been doing this annually since back in the 80s. So there's, there's quite a few fish that have reward tags and tags regular tags out there. So if an angler sees a, a fish or catches one with a tag, whether, whether or not it's a reward tag, you want that information back and that's vital to us. Yes, it's vital for all our studies. It helps us uh, devise our uh, population estimates and gives us information about growth catch rates, uh, mortality rates and such. And if you don't want to keep the fish, you can take the tag off. There is a spot on our thing for released fish but keep the tag and report the information on where you caught the fish. And um, yeah, if I could turn to, so we've already started to get both questions online also for, from some of the regis, uh, um, registrations prior to the webinar. Um, one of the questions that we, we did get is, what if you do want to release a fish? As Catherine just mentioned, if it's a tag fish, we'd like you to remove the tag and then safely release it. But also, um, 
you know, what if you catch a sturgeon? And we had anglers already potentially catch, or one angler catch one mm -hmm. of the release sturgeon in the Saginaw River system. So I guess, you know, um, just to highlight in the fishing guide, there's a section on um, what to do if you catch a fish you want to release. Um, and that guy, or that there, it's a table that it basically um, good practices that you should uh, um, undertake to make sure the fish is released safely. Um, information that you can maybe share afterwards, but you know, just uh, you can look through the guide. There's there's um, guidelines on releasing fish uh, safely, um, and that was one of the questions. And I think that table is on page 34. Um, so. You know, just to kind of address one of the questions again, what if, what if I want to release a fish safely? How should I do it? And then what are some guidelines? Page 34 in the guide would, would have that. Um, we also received a, uh, a lot of questions on uh, PFOS and PFOA across the state, both within the Huron Basin, but also other basins across the state. Um, so I think Megan and Elise might have some information they could share on this. Yes, thank you, Randy. Um, so as Randy noted, during the webinar registration, we did receive a number of different questions related to PFAS and PFOS. Um, and we wanted to direct people to um, two different websites. Um, so there is a PFAS action response team within the state of Michigan that is working to be proactive um, in addressing this issue. And it involves um, 10 different state departments that are working with local and federal officials across Michigan to ensure that public health and safety of residents are, is protected while ensuring that the public health and safety uh, is connected to uh, the environmental heritage and is secured for generations of Michiganders to come. So you can uh, learn more about um, this issue by visiting the michigan.gov slash PFAS response uh, website. And then from there, uh, you can, uh, they have a, tile that is uh, related to fish and wildlife where you can get more information on uh, PFAS and fish but also in deer if you um, enjoy hunting and they have consumption guidelines for fish um, with elevated PFAS levels so using the eat safe fish guide in Michigan um, they have outlined different information but this would be the best resource to look at when uh, looking to get information about PFAS within the state of Michigan and it's updated regularly. So highly recommend you checking out michigan.gov slash PFAS response to answer any questions you have related to this issue within the state of Michigan. Yeah, thanks Megan. And, and I would also add that um, there's a lot of new information coming in rapidly. So, um, you know, the, visit that website, the uh, PFAS response at Michigan gov um, for updated information because it's posted there um, so we get that a lot in terms of what recent findings also in terms of eat uh, save fish on page 32 in the guide there's a table that kind of gives some general guidelines and also reference of of how you can look at other contaminants and other ways of um, consuming fish safely in Michigan which again was one of the questions addressed to us so uh, page 32 of the guide has a, has a good information on that. Another question we got um, it was in reference to walleye populations that are connected to Saginaw Bay. So what about Tawas Bay? What about uh, Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie and how do they relate? Um, and so we, you know, we look at that. Uh, we have a lot of information to show, maybe Jim can speak to, you know, Tawas Bay and why mm -hmm. it isn't as productive as other areas. Um, and then I'll cover maybe some of the connectedness with uh, the St. Clair River. So why isn't Tawas Bay? Well, with Saginaw regard Bay? to Tawas Bay, it is, it has more characteristics of the main basin of Lake Huron than the inner part of Saginaw Bay does. Uh, the water tends to take a lot longer to warm up up there. Uh, the Tawas Bay is somewhat more sterile. Uh, there's not as much plankton uh, in the water and so forth. As a result, there's often uh, lower numbers of forage fish in the bay. And uh, for this reason, uh, the fishery up there is some, pretty much a fraction of what you would find in the inner part of Saginaw Bay, which would be anywhere from Augray south into the main base or the main part of the bay. 
Uh, so Talos Bay always has lower numbers of fish. And if you look at our Creel census results over the years, uh, the fishery up there is significant, but it is a, just a fraction of the fishery we have in the inner bay. Yeah, great point, Jim. And I'm glad you mentioned the Creel program. We have probably one of the most extensive Creel programs to get information from anglers, uh, what they catch, um, you know, the, the health of the fish they're catching, and uh, Saginaw Bay is, is by far, um, you know, again, one of the destination fisheries. And mm -hmm. so we can look at catch rates in and outside of Saginaw Bay. Um, but what about the connectedness, connectedness to St. Clair River and uh, Lake Erie? You know, there's actually some research done in this and about 25% of the walleye on average caught in all of Saginaw Bay, inner and outer, at, um, can be up to 25% from the Lake Erie reproduction. Uh, again, that was, you know, one estimate of how many mm -hmm. fish might be moving across the system. You know, fish have fins and they do swim and we know that they move around, but... Uh, and it varies from year to year yep. also because when, uh, when there's large amounts of natural reproduction down in Lake Erie, those fish spread out and a lot of them will come to our area. On the other hand, their reproduction down there can be quite sporadic. So at some times we are not getting nearly as many fish out of uh, Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. And at other times we're getting quite a few. And uh, just to mention, you know, Jim also talked about the excitement of the Atlantic Salmon Program and some of the uh, great stocking and survival we're getting in Lexington and those fish are we're giving back to Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie because right. I think some of those Atlantic salmon are Atlantic moving salmon, down there. A lot of them will wander <laughs> down into the St. Clair River and into Lake St. Clair. So we get a few of their walleyes, they get a few of our Atlantics. One hand is washing the other here. And um, yeah, so I think we had one other question that kind of talked about, you know, how do we coordinate those? And uh, again, we have cit citizen uh, fishery advisory committees on all the lakes. Um, and uh, a lot of the representatives from Lake Erie and Lake Huron um, sit jointly or they communicate back and forth. Likewise, um, internally, we have basin teams uh, for Lake Huron and Lake Erie that share information and, mm -hmm. and uh, talk about these trends. So a lot of coordination to make sure the fishery is managed, uh, again, as, as um, for the most opportunity while also protecting uh, the health of the populations. Um, with that, I, I, you know, I think we're getting close to the end of this webinar. One Jim? other point I would make about the difference between Saginaw Bay and, say, the St. Clair River and Lake St. Clair, Randy, is that uh, those fisheries down there are managed by two different countries. Yes. Uh, and so there is a certain amount of uh, coordination between Michigan and the province of Ontario on fishing regulations in the St. Clair system. Uh, and also the Detroit River, I believe. Uh, whereas in Saginaw Bay, Michigan is the only jurisdiction uh, surrounding the bay. And so we have a bit more leeway in being exclusive in how we manage Saginaw Bay. Yep, great, great point. A good one to end on. So I guess I'll turn it back over to Megan and Elise, uh, um, how we can maybe respond to some of the comments that we didn't get a chance to uh, today. And um, any wrap-up comments for the webinar? Yeah, thank you so much, Randy and Jim and Catherine, for sharing all that great information um, in today's webinar. I guess I had one more question, and Elise, you might be able to answer this for me. So we keep talking about this fishing guide. Where can you find one? I know it's available online, but can you also find one in print? Yes, so we do have printed copies available at licensed retailers and many DNR offices located around the state. Ideally, when you purchase a Michigan fishing license in person, you are offered a copy of the guide so that you can have it in your tackle box or your boat or on your person so that you know the fishing rules and regulations when you head out to go fishing. But we actually recommend people keep track of the electronic version. Occasionally, we have to make reg changes in the middle of the season. Okay. Um, that can be an emergency purpose or just something that comes up of the moment and we have to be ready to respond to it and the printed version cannot necessarily reflect those so what's great about the electronic version is that it's up to date all the time so you always have the most recent regulations and plus you can keep it wherever you want so it, you can download it right to your smartphone or your device and keep it in your pocket so um, but there's plenty of options to get a printed copy if that's what you prefer 
Okay, that's great. Yeah, and I you know on my phone I like to bookmark certain pages. So yeah. thinking to all the different pages that Randy referenced that are <laughs> right. really helpful to go back to, that would be helpful for really uh, being able to use the fishing guide throughout the season. So as we conclude today's webinar, if you have additional questions, um, we wanted to share our contact information. So you can contact the Bay City uh, Customer Service Center at this number. And then you also have all of our emails um, for any follow-up questions that you might have uh, beyond the um, what we covered during today's conversations and coffee. So just wanted to say thank you all for joining us on this pilot of the digital conversations and coffee. We hope you enjoyed the experience and um, we Look forward to connecting with all of you again soon to discuss uh, the fishery um, in Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron.